Hi, this is a lecture video on disorder, entropy, and second law. So you have seen second law stated in a few different ways. The Clausius statement, the Kelvin statement, and finally, statement based on change of new quantity called entropy. Now, for those of you who intend to major in physics, I hope you have this sense that all this is very interesting and deeply unsatisfactory. This is what I mean. These all three ways of stating the second law of thermodynamics seem to be related. But why should they be? And if they are related, and you can kind of show why, which of these three statements is the most uh, fundamental? We call physics the fundamental science, and it's not just the physicists being pompous. We do actually seek to explain the laws of nature in the most fundamental way possible. And these three ways of describing the second law are unsatisfactory because they are phenomenological descriptions. What it means is it's based on phenomenon, as in we are trying to describe the experimental observations. Not based on first principles, but based on trying to explain what you see. In fact, the way we introduce the change of entropy is an example of that. And this is kind of why later on we had to qualify that this only applies to reversible processes. Because that's the phenomenon we used to come up with it. And we realized when we try to apply to irreversible processes, non-quasi-static processes that it didn't work. So for especially those of you intending to major in physics, if you have that feeling of dissatisfaction, then your heart is in the right place. Now, there's a second feature of the second law that begs for an explanation. Some textbooks refer to it poetically as arrow of time. What it means is the second law is the only law that says something about flow of time. It refers to irreversible processes. If you go back and look at all the other laws of physics that we have covered, including the first law of thermodynamics, you'll find that they are all reversible. They hold when you reverse the direction of time. It's true for conservation laws, for obvious reasons, it deals with equality. And it also holds for things like Newton's laws. So second law is special, and this raises the question, why is the second law special? It's these questions that I'm hoping to answer in this lecture. Now, the challenge with the thermodynamics is that the system we are trying to describe is too complex. In physics, we are not used to dealing with the 10 to 20, 10 to 30 particles. In upper division statistical mechanics, you are going to develop tools that can be used to analyze these systems. But for the purpose of this class, let me use a toy model to illustrate the ideas without getting too deep into the mathematical analysis. So this is going to be our system. We are going to have 25 coins that can have heads and tails. Let me get 25 of these. All right, there are 25 coins nicely lined up. Let me give them coordinates so that I have some way of referring to them. So for example, if I wanted to refer to this coin here, I would refer to coin 4, 3. All right, now what I want to illustrate here is how random process will inevitably lead this system from order to disorder. So let me start out with the most ordered possible version of this system, all heads. Without going into complicated mathematical detail, it intuitively feels ordered, right? Now I need to introduce a random process and for that, I wrote a little Python function. So in this little Python script, I have a list that's a list of these coordinates of 25 coins. And Python has a function that I can use to take a sample of five out of this list at random. And I'm going to use this to choose 
five coins to flip each time. Each time its number comes up, it gets toggled from head to tail, tail to head. We'll go through a few iterations of this and let's see what we end up with. Oh, I can use this as the first iteration. Let me flip those coins. All right, replace those coins with the tail version. Second round. Replace them one by one with their other version. You can flip back and forth in the video if you want to make sure I'm not cheating. Okay, another cycle. All right, double check, it's right. One more cycle. All right, keep going. One more cycle. All right, I don't have all day, so let me do it two more times, and then we'll call it a day, see what we have, and we'll talk over that. So one more. And now the last one. All right, let's call it a day. Let's do the tally of what we have. We'll just count the number of heads and tails. So counting the number of heads, one, two, I'll count silently. 13, 14, 14. Counting the number of tails, one, two, ten, 11, 11. And they add up to 25, just a quick checksum. It's a curious statistical fact that random process wasn't trying to enforce some 50-50 ratio of heads and tail. I was just picking some coins at random to flip. And if we were to continue this process indefinitely, you would find that the number of heads and tail fluctuate around about half. And it's this phenomenon that we are referring to when we say that the state of a system tends to disorder. I guess you could consider this another statement of second law. And you might have heard of entropy being described as a measure of disorder. So I hope this example with 25 coins gives you some intuition for how a state starting with a perfectly ordered system tends toward the disorder with the introduction of random processes. And it doesn't seem to go the other way, even though nothing in the setup of these coins prevents all of the coins somehow being flipped to all head again, or to all tails. We can explain this with ideas from combinatorics and the idea of microstates and macrostates. But 25 coins are too many. Let me reduce the number down to four and we'll talk about it. So with the four coins, it becomes possible to list every state of the system. From combinatorics with the four places and two states possible for each place, you have the number of possible states figured out this way. You take number of possibilities for each place raised to the power of number of places. So this is 16. Still kind of large, but not as large as it would have been if it was raised to 25th power. All right, so let me just uh, list them all. I gotta make this coin smaller if I'm gonna fit them. They are being grouped in some kind of fashion if you can figure it out. Almost there. And that's the last one. Let me make sure that I have 16. One, five, 11, 16. And then I don't have any duplicates. All right, so this is the complete listing of all possible states of a four coin system. And I hope you figured out how I was organizing them. Each of them are grouped by sharing the same number of heads and tails. You could almost think of one almost as being the bird's eye view or the forest and the other one as being the trees. We introduce a new vocabulary to describe this. 
The states shown on top are called microstates. And the states shown on the bottom are the macrostates. All the descriptions of thermodynamic systems we have been using so far are the descriptions of macrostates. You can kind of see that because the macrostates are characterized by the average quantities or the aggregate quantities. And that's a good description of temperature relating to average kinetic energy and pressure and maybe volume relating to the aggregate quantities. And what we are positing in the statistical mechanics is that for each of these macrostates, there's an underlying microstate that can correspond to that macrostate. In fact, here there's a six different versions. And here's a canonical assumption that you will hear in statistical mechanics, is that each microstate is equally likely. I hope that makes intuitive sense. It's like when you have a six-sided dice, you throw it, you have an equal chance of getting one or six, or any other number in between, one in six chance. So what this statement is saying is given 16, possible microstates, you have 1 in 16 chance of getting any one of them. And given this assumption of equality, the natural question is, why are macrostates so unequal? As you saw in the previous example, with the introduction of random process, I don't have equal chance of getting all heads as getting half heads and half tail. And this figure is an explanation of why. Some macrostates contain in themselves more microstates. There's a six that can lead to two heads to tail possibility. But there's only one microstate that can lead to all head possibility. If you go through math, what you will quickly find is that as the number of particles increase, this disparity becomes much more extreme. So here, with only four coins, the even distribution is only six times more likely than all heads or all tails possibility. But as your textbook lists, even with 100 coins, which is reaching nowhere near the statistical systems we deal with, something like 10 to 10, 10 to 20 number of particles, the difference between the number of microstates in the macrostate representing the sort of even distribution and microstates in the macrostate representing a very skewed result, like all of the gas molecules being collected into a corner of a room, becomes extreme. This is why if you took four coins and flipped them all in the air, it is most likely for you to get two heads and two tails. Now with only four coins, you have a fairly significant probability of getting maybe three heads and one tail. Four in 16 chance is nothing to sniff at. Now getting all heads, that is less likely, one in 16, but this is what one in 16 means. It means if you did that experiment 16 times, you have a decent shot of getting it once. So this is the mathematical fact, statistical fact, that's underlying description of anything, from the toy model that we've been talking about to the real-world system of ideal guess. And all these different statements of second law, what we've been talking about so far, what they are really saying is they are describing how when you start from a macro state that is quite unlikely, and it goes through some random process or stochastic process, then it is mostly likely to land on the macrostate with the most number of microstates because it's most likely. This leads to the statement of second law that is my favorite version of second law. So let me give that statement and leave it there. My most favorite statement of second law says this. What is most likely to happen, happens most of the time.
Those of you who go on to study statistical mechanics in upper division, this describes mostly chemistry and physics majors, you will get a chance to see what we mean by this statement. So with that, this is the last lecture on thermodynamics. Congratulations on reaching this far, and I'll see you in the exam. Bye.